Bible, go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. As you're going there, I'm just going to pray that the word would change you as you say it to yourself. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to be the conduit that just uh, brings heaven and, and, and heaven and earth together. Amen. And, and let's just watch it collide and let's just watch things happen tonight in the presence of the Lord. As you're going to Colossians chapter 3, if you are there, shout amen. amen. Let's look down at verse number 8 and it's going to read something like this. But now you yourselves are to put off. Everybody say put off. Put off. put off these things. Now, I'm going to read them, and you're going to say, I don't have those. Anger. <laughs> wrath. Oh, we got laughing already. Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. I figured I'd give you a moment there. <laughs> filthy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. This is scripture, since you have put off the old man and his, and with his deeds. How many of you have put off the old man? Amen. We put off the old man. If we put off the old man, we shouldn't be acting like the old man. And you have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, nor circumcised or uncircumcised, a Scythian, slave nor free, for Christ is all in all. He's in all of us. Therefore, as the elect of God, tell your neighbor, that's me and you, holy and beloved, put on the tender mercies, the kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Now, this is what you're supposed to look like. Verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against anybody else, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. That's a command. That's not a request. But above all of these things, put on love, which is the bond. It's a glue of perfection. You want the church to look perfect? Let the glue be bond, or let love be the glue. That bonds us together. And let the peace of God rule in your heart to which also you were called in one body. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and, and hymns. See, that's why we still got to sing hymns every once in a while. And spiritual songs. That's why we sing worship songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, Whatever you do, do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, that says a whole lot. That tells you what we used to be and what we ought to be now. It tells you where we've come from. It tells you the picture of what your old life is supposed to be like, anger and malice and cussing each other out. That's what the old life is supposed to look like. But then it tells you what the new life is supposed to look like. That you are merciful. That you are, are humble and meek and long-suffering. I would like to focus tonight. Uh, this is going to be out of, out of the norm a little bit. Put verse 13 up for me. That we would bear with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another... Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Now, I'm going to ask him to leave that verse up there just for a few moments because I want you to write it down, underline it, highlight it, whatever you've got to do to remind yourself. We are supposed to be patient with one another. We are supposed to be kind and sometimes enduring with one another. We are supposed to forgive one another. Even as Christ forgave you, we are supposed to forgive one another. I'd like to talk to you tonight about the bondage of unforgiveness. Now, as I give you that title, the bondage of unforgiveness, many of you in this room or watching may say to yourselves, well, I don't have unforgiveness, so this sermon is not for me. I'm going to ask you to be patient with me for a little while, and I'm going to tell you why later, because you may have unforgiveness and not realize you have unforgiveness. Just to prove it to you, 
I think the reason the Lord gave me this sermon is, is a couple of weeks ago, I, I listened to a sermon that my wife had shared with me. And as I listened to it, and let me just break it down for you. It, it was a, a, a pastor teaching on the Jezebel spirit. Now, I'm not going to get into the Jezebel spirit tonight. That's another day. But I listened to the, this sermon and this teaching, and I've never heard any teaching like it before. And as he's teaching, I was identifying with a lot of things he was teaching. The effects of the Jezebel spirit, what comes after it and what comes with it. And he was teaching about this spirit and what it does to people. And I was thinking to myself, I, I can identify with a lot of the outcomes and, and a lot of the effects of the Jezebel spirit. But I thought to myself, right now, I don't have what we normally call, normally you have people or a person in your life that is, that is in, 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 really uh, affecting everybody and infecting everybody with this spirit. I was thinking to myself, I don't have currently anyone in that condition. Thankfully, so far we've been able to run most of them off, and and uh, and and I don't currently have a person I couldn't identify. But I thought to myself, brother Randy, I thought, but but what he's identifying. Sure is a lot of what I'm dealing with. And I just began to pray and I began to pray, Lord, I, I'm, I'm identifying with the effects of this spirit, but I don't have that person in my life. And I just began to tell the Lord, Lord, I need you to show me. And as soon as I said that, the Lord took me back 26 years. Wow. 26 years. And it was a part of my life you know, sometimes our history, we don't even think about it. It's just, it's just history. It's something that's not there anymore. But I began to realize that there was something released upon me 26 years ago that I didn't think about it, didn't ponder on it, didn't even realize it was there until I, and I heard something that I already knew. And I began to pray, and before I was done praying, the Lord identified two situations in my life. So you may be thinking to yourself, well, I don't have unforgiveness. Just be patient with me just for a few moments. You may have some things there that you are not familiar with. But to forgive somebody means that you pardon them. You, you grant them relief of whatever has been done to you. You cancel an offense. And I've heard, an, I don't know how many people say, well, I don't want them to think they're getting away with it. Be patient with me. Because forgiving somebody of an offense doesn't mean you're giving them permission to say that it was okay. You are releasing yourself from the bondage of unforgiveness. It's not about you releasing them from something. You are releasing yourself from a situation. Amen. But the inability to forgive places your spirit and your mind in prison. It becomes a stronghold. When you are unwilling to forgive or you don't realize you need to forgive, sometimes, you know, it's not that you are unwilling to do it. Sometimes you, you've been in situations and you just never forgave a person for something and you don't realize that you've been carrying that baggage not thinking that you needed somehow, some way to release that to God. But if you're unwilling to forgive nor, nor if you haven't done it because you haven't thought about it, it places your mind and your spirit in a prison. And you're giving the person that you're mad at the key to the prison that you put yourself in. Mm -hmm. He preaching. The inability to forgive allows the offender and the offense to hold power over you. You're giving them the ability in that situation to hold. And, and you think to yourself that you hold on to it. And you, you've got reasons why you hold on to things. But really you are giving, you're giving permission to that spirit to hold you in bondage. It locks you in bondage, it causes resentment, it causes hate, it torments you. And, and I was dealing with things that I didn't realize that I was dealing with and it, 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 it could be traced back to that stuff. 
I thought that the only person that I needed to forgive that I hadn't, I already had. I, I thought that that guy that I dealt with, that man, man, I wanted to punch him in the face. And, and, uh, but I forgave him, babe. I, 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 I spoke those words to him. I forgive you. And I thought that was it. I, I've done inventory before. Anybody ever done inventory? I've done inventory and really, really thought that everything was good. I didn't realize that I was still having the effects of Jezebel, of unforgiveness. Now, if you look at this verse, bearing with one another, that's telling you that dealing with people is not always going to be easy. Can I get an amen? (laughs) I said this not long ago. Hurt and abandonment can only come from people who you are close to. You can't be abandoned by strangers or people you're not close to. Abandonment, hurt, people who suffer with the orphan spirit. That's another sermon for another day. But the Bible tells us that we must bear with one another, that we're going to have differences, that we're going to have different opinions, we're going to have different likes. Even siblings don't like the same things. Spouses don't like the same things. Best of friends oftentimes don't like the same things. And there's some things you've got to compromise and, and bear with one another. You know, there, there, there are certain people in certain churches, and, and this side wants it that way, and another side want, wants it that way. I was in a church in Akron, Ohio one time, absolutely true story and I don't you remember this and the guy was talking to us about the separation of a church and how one church said one side of the church literally said on one side and the other said on the other side and it was the difference over a hymn book one side wanted one hymn book and the other side wanted the other hymn book People that fight over what color carpet they're going to have. People that fight over what color the wall is. People that, people that, that fight over, over uh, simple little things. But, but the fact is the Bible encourages us that we are supposed to still love each other through differences. We are supposed to bear one another. Now listen, there are people in life that you're going to say they are un. Unbearable. If they're unbearable, then you stop hanging out with the unbearable people. The Bible says love them. It doesn't say pack up a tent and hang out with them every day. Now, if you're married to them, that's a different subject. We got counseling for that. <laughs> Forgiving one another. If anybody has a complaint, if anybody has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you forgive them. Forgiveness is not optional. We feel like the, we, before we can forgive, we need to be justified and let, you know, it's like, okay, before, before I get over this, you know, I've got to have an answer. I've got to have a vindication. I've got to have vengeance. I've got to do all these things. The Lord just simply says, listen, did I ask for all of that when you came to me and asked for forgiveness? No, what the Lord did is the Lord took your stuff and he cast it as far as the east is from the west and he cast it into the depths of the sea never to be remembered anymore. He took the charges that you had against him. He remembers all the times you drug his name through the dirt and you used his name in vain and he remembers all the times that that you were ashamed of him. But yet when you come before him, he doesn't require anything of you other than saying, please forgive me. And when you do that, what does he do? He forgives you. And he expects us to do the same with one another. If if somebody's willing to come to you and say, listen, I'm sorry I've offended you, then the Bible says you must forgive them, period. No more questions asked. But the majority of the time, people aren't going to come to you and ask for your forgiveness. The majority of the time, people are going to say, you got what you deserve. And what you need to do is love the hell out of them. Half the church just said, what did he say? (laughs) You see, people like that have got hell in them. They've got darkness in them. So I wasn't saying a bad thing just now. I'm literally saying you need to love the darkness out because hell is in them. The devil is in them. Darkness is in them. And what you've got to do is love it out. Better paraphrasing it. Let's make it more churchy. Kill them with kindness. (laughs) 
the, in, the inability to forgive steals your joy, yeah. steals your peace, yeah. steals your blessing, yeah. steals your life, yeah. takes your health. Yeah. Takes your health. It destroys your ability to live freely. It, it can destroy your ability to dream. And it will absolutely, in some people, crush your ability to trust. Yes. Yep. I've had Christians come in, in, in this church and other churches that I've been a part of. Christians come into the church and say that they didn't want to be a part of anything. They didn't want to do anything. They just wanted to be here. And I, I would ask them why. They said, well, I don't trust anybody. That's ungodly. That's unchristian like. That's unchrist like. That is not Christ's character. Christ's character is I realize that you have a past, but I forgive you because of your past. Now, listen, I'm not telling you to lay your life on the line for everybody. I'm not telling you just to trust anybody, but you can't go through your life not trusting everybody. You got to put your trust in some people. You've got to, but 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 also know this: if you have an expectation that Christians will never let you down, you're going to be disappointed. If you have an expectation that the preacher will never make you mad, you're going to be disappointed. If you have the understanding, I'm going to trust you, but yet I know that you are fragile as I am, and you're not perfect, and you can fail just as much as I can fail. When people maybe break your trust, it doesn't hurt you as bad because there's something within you that understands they are human just like I am. So it says right there that you must forgive each other. Now, how many of you can quote for me the Lord's Prayer? Many times whenever I lay down to go to sleep, if I don't have other things to pray about and, and Sarah's already asleep, I'll just kind of lay there and, and I'll just say, you know, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses or forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is... That was Jesus saying this is how you should pray. And that's, that's located in Matthew chapter 6. And, and that's verses 9 through 13. And that's what he's telling you to do. And he's saying this is how you pray. But if you read Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 13 and you stop there, you'll say to yourself, well, that's how the Lord prays. But then you have to look at verse number 14. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Leaving that verse up there just for a moment. How many of us are in danger of hell's flames or the lake of fire combined with hell because we refuse to forgive somebody. And Jesus right there says, if you don't forgive them at the, at the junction of your life where you stop forgiving other people, I can no longer forgive you. No matter how many times you pray and ask him for mercy, the Lord is saying, when you stop forgiving other people, I stop forgiving you. Because if you're going to ask God for mercy, you must be willing to give the same mercy to other people. You can't ask God for mercy and grace and then refuse to give mercy and grace to other people. At that juncture that you say, I'm no longer forgiving them, the Lord says, well, I'm sorry, but I can neither forgive you. He didn't just give us the Lord's prayer, but he also let us know praying in unforgiveness is literally a waste of your time. He said to the, he said a sermon on the mount, hey folks, this is the way I want you to pray. It's a beautiful prayer. And he ends it, yours is the kingdom, the glory, the power. Boy, he ends it gracefully. But then he says, but I want you to know one thing. If you have unforgiveness, don't pray that prayer. Won't do you no good. People sitting in churches every Sunday and maybe just maybe somebody tonight, I don't know, but I'm preaching this for a reason, that can't seem to figure out why they can't get ahead. People that can't get healed of sickness, people that can't seem to get ahead, people that have brokenness that they just can't seem to get healed and on and on and on and on. And you can many times trace it back to the unwillingness or the inability to forgive the trespasses of other people. You mean to tell me that even my healing is connected to unforgiveness? I'll tell you in, here in just a moment, yes. 
Your healing is to connected to unforgiveness. Your salvation is connected to your ability to forgive. Your sanity, your, your dream, your life, everything that you're going through. You see, God cannot give you something that you're unwilling to give somebody else. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. In order to truly receive all of the grace and mercy of God, you've got to give that freely you received, freely give. Look at that. Write it down. But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you of yours. I could stop right there and just say, that's it. That's the sermon. The bondage of unforgiveness can actually cause you to miss heaven. Because if you continue to sin, every sin that you commit after that, you're no longer forgiven for it. How many believers knowingly or unknowingly sit and they are bound by unforgiveness? They are in bondage. They can't They can't find an answer. I'm going to tell you sometimes evaluation. And and if you can't figure it out, pray, Lord, show me. And I'm just going to pause here just for a second because I know some of you. I don't know all of your lives. I don't know where you go every day. I've got neighbors here tonight. I I don't know everything about their lives. But I would dare to say that some of you are feeling fire underneath your bottom parts right now because the Lord's speaking to you and as I look out I know there's some people in this room who are hurting hurting because some things been done to you there's very few people in this room that some nasty things haven't been done to them we've suffered loss we've suffered abandonment we've suffered persecution We've suffered false accusation. We've suffered hate. We've suffered all of those things. As many of you have, you know what it's like for somebody to just turn on you, to hate you, to abandon you, to just walk out. People who gained your trust and then broke it and broke you in the process. I'm not preaching at you tonight. I'm preaching for you. The Lord is preaching for you, and he's letting you know that you are able. You are able to break this spirit of bondage, of fear, and unforgiveness. You are able to come before him. Listen, whenever the Lord revealed that to me, I'm going to say it was two weeks ago, whenever the Lord revealed that to me, it wasn't necessary for me to go to people 26 years ago. It was necessary for me in that situation to go before my Heavenly Father because I'm no longer even connected to those people. I mean, they're just, they're just, they're a thought in the wind. So I, I, can't, I can't just drive down the road and go to their house and say, hey, I forgive you for that. But I could get down up on my knees and say, Lord, I, I want you to know that I forgive them, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that you, re- that you release me, Lord, from every chain of bondage that was holding me down, Father. And I begin to intercede for those people as well, Father. I pray for them that their eyes would be open. And I just gave it to God. There are times where you need to go to those people, but there are just times where you need to go before the Father. Father and release them to the Lord and and give them to God. We are unable to forgive if we hold on to it, but we are able to forgive if we have faith in the word of God and we have faith in God, we can forgive any situation. Preacher, you don't know how bad I've been hurt. If you let your faith stand up in obedience to God's word, God's love can allow you to do what your flesh cannot do. God's love can allow you to do what your flesh cannot do. Preacher, they don't deserve my unforgiveness. You're right, but you do deserve that unforgiveness. You you deserve to forgive them. You, You deserve to not let that cause you to be bound anymore. They may not deserve it. They may still be the nastiest person living on the planet Earth. Again, your forgiveness is not for them. Your forgiveness is not taking the cuffs off of them. Your forgiveness is taking the cuffs off of you. 
You're letting, you're letting people live rent-free right here. As long as you hold that against them, you're letting them live rent-free rent right here. They're constantly on your mind. Rent-free. Today is the day to give them an eviction notice. When you forgive people, it will bring healing. It will bring restoration. It will bring peace. It will bring life to you. Don't you think you deserve it? Forgiving an offense will release you from the stronghold that it will no longer control you. Because unforgiveness is a stronghold. But praise God, your weapons are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. You see, it's not your ability. It's God's ability through you. Man, as you release the hurt, as you release the pain, you'll no longer define your life by the past, but you'll now define your life according to your destiny. No longer defined by yesterday, now I'm defined by tomorrow. I'm not defined by what happened back there. I'm defined in what God's about to do in me today, amen? I'm defined by where I'm going, not where I've been. That's the difference. Forgiving an offense does not, listen to me, does not require you to re-enter fellowship. It requires God's love and forgiveness. Forgiving someone doesn't mean that you're saying to them, I want to hang out with you. I love a lot of people that I don't want to hang out with. I love a lot of people that I, I don't really ever know if I want to see them again. But I'm required to love them in the Lord. Now, preacher, you make it sound easy. No, no, it's not. I have to pray for the Lord's strength to love people that are unlovable. I have to pray for strength. Okay. Some of the people that I dislike the most on this planet dislike their behavior, their character, are people that I call master manipulators. They are masters at it. They play with people and they use people like a toy to get what they want and get gain of this world and... and, and Sarah and I were talking about it, and I used to say that I knew three. I used to say that I've known three master manipulators in my life, and I, I still know all three of them. Until two weeks ago when the Lord showed me one from 26 years ago that was more masterful than the other three put together. Master manipulators, people who just take advantage of you and take advantage of everybody else, and they know how to play everybody around them. Oh, it just runs through my blood. Oh, mm. I'd like to turn a cheek, you know, the earthly way sometimes. I'm just being honest with you. Do you not think those thoughts? But the love of the Lord requires you to see them in public and shake their hand and say, how are you doing? The love of the Lord will allow you to pray for those people. I'm doing it. My wife is my witness that I pray for those people. I... and. Some of you may be thinking, well, tell us who they are. No, those are my people. I'm still, I'm still in fellowship with some of these people. Still, still loving them in God. Not hanging out with them every day. But I'll see them occasionally and I'm still praying for them. Why? Because I've released them to the Lord. They're not my problem. They're not my problem. You see, once I learned that they were manipulators, my, the light was turned on. And now I'm, I know to be cautious. I know how to answer certain questions. I know when they ask certain questions, they just fishing for information. And so I'm going to change the subject. How about that weather? You, you see that game yesterday? And, and you know, it's like they, they eventually they're going to find out he knows who I am. Forgiveness does not declare that the acts that have been done by others are okay. Forgiveness, the purpose of it is to release you from bondage. It, it, forgiveness is required to mend. I like this. Thank you, Lord, for this. Forgiveness is required to mend some relationships while forgiveness is required to relinquish others. Forgiveness is required to mend some relationships while it is required to relinquish others. 
Forgiveness must be the character of a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you're in this room and you profess to be a Christian, your character must be that of forgiveness. Has to be that of forgiveness. Now let me, let me go to one more place. I'm going to go to James chapter 5. I'm going to show you something here that the elders, some of the elders are going to be happy that I'm pointing this out. Because we've talked about this many times. James chapter 5, verse number 14. Is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. But confess your trespasses to one another. Confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your trespasses that you may be healed. Confess your unforgiveness that you may be healed. Confess your sins that you may be healed. Forgive others that you may be healed. Forgive yourself so that you can be healed. Repent of your own sins that you can be healed. Forgive people of their sins so that you may be healed. There's a prerequisite here for you to be healed. You must forgive and be forgiven. Wow. The effect of fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Leaving that verse up there. Let me say that one more time. In order sometimes to be healed, you must forgive and be forgiven. So sometimes the elders or the altar workers may, may be operating in discernment whenever some folks come up here and they say to you, is there anything you need to confess or is there anyone that you need to forgive? Because praying for a person who is full of unforgiveness is a waste of time. Praying for healing over someone that has unforgiveness is not going to work. Because the Lord, again, cannot do a work in you because you have built the dam of unforgiveness and that box you have placed yourself in, I'm not letting anybody else in. I don't trust anybody. Not only did you kick everybody else out, but God is saying when you kick them out, you also kick me out because if you don't trust them, you don't love them, if you don't forgive them, I can't forgive you. No matter how many elders lay hands upon you, no matter how many Benny hens or whoever else lays hands upon you, you can, unless the mercy of God falls upon you, you will not be healed and it'll be because you have unforgiveness in your heart. When you come before God asking God to give you anything, that's what, let me, I wish I had time to preach all of this for you tonight. Maybe I'll preach on prayer pretty soon. But that's why he said, for, let me forgive others as you forgive me. When you come before God, even when I pray every day, I don't just go before the Lord and start with my supplication. Lord, here, this is what I need. I start as Matthew chapter 6 tells me to. I start with adoration and I start with praise, telling him how good he is. I, I go before his courts and, 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 and with praise and thanksgiving. I come in. And before I pray for myself, I intercede for others because that's what Matthew chapter 6 does. Lord, forgive those who've sinned against us. I pray for the other people who are sick. I pray for those who've sinned against me. I pray for those that I need to forgive. Before I get to myself, I'm a firm believer that when you pray, unless it's one of those, you know, absolute, you know, in a, in a hurry kind of moment prayer, if you go to your prayer closet or if, you, if you're praying, before you get to yourself, you have acknowledged and praised your God and lifted up the needs of other people before you take yourself before God. Well, preacher, why would you do that? Because the Bible tells me to, and I, I could teach this another day, but it tells us to intercede for those other people, intercede for others. And sometimes it may not be you that has unforgiveness. Maybe it's your first cousin or your spouse or, or your uncle, somebody that you know that has unforgiveness. You need to intercede that God would melt their heart. You need to share this message with them. You need to purchase it on a CD or share it when it comes out on the internet. You need to tell them that, that they don't need to be defined by their past anymore, that God has freed them from that, that when they forgive those people, God in that moment sets you free and you are free indeed. But if you hold on to it, if you hold on to it, 
Psalm 66, 18, he said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He will not hear me. I preached something similar to this at a youth camp many, many years ago. And the Lord's putting this illustration in my, in my spirit as I'm preaching to you. And uh, See, that's how I preach. As the Lord speaks it to me, I just do it. Uh, and so sometimes you just have to, you just have to listen to the Lord and, and give the Lord what he wants. Brother Stan, would you come up here just for a moment? I'm going to do an illustration and then I'm going to pray over you. But you see here, <clears throat> here's what happens. You come before the Lord and you give your, you know, you give your life to the Lord and, and that's a beautiful thing. But along the way, okay, along the way, somebody did something against you. And so what you've done is you've picked up an offense. You are now angry. And sometimes we say nasty things about that people, those people. Sometimes we hope they die. We say that. I hope what you did to me that it happens to you because we, we want vengeance against someone even though the Bible says that, listen, vengeance is mine. The Lord says what you're wanting is mine. Don't pray over them. But the, the, the Bible says when you pray over them, it what? Heaps, heaps that coal upon them. But when, you, when you're offended now, now you've got that offense and you carry that around. And, and so whenever the worship team gets up here praising, so if you go to lift up your hands, guess what you're trying to praise over? Go ahead and lift up both hands, our brother Stan, and just worship the Lord. Well, guess, guess what? That arm's going to get pretty tired pretty quickly. Why? Because you're carrying that offense. It's the bait of Satan. It's the bait of Satan. So, brother Stan, you're in church, and somebody else comes along and says something that you are now mad about, and you, you now are upset with somebody else. You don't need that cert. Now you come to church and you're trying to praise God and give God your best, but now you've got more offenses than really you can carry. It used to be that you came up front and you came around the altar and you gave God everything that you have, but now it's more tiring for you to leave your seat. It's more comfortable just to stay in your seat when the church is really having church. You used to be in the fire. You used to be in the water. You used to be in the presence of God, but now it's so tiring because you've got this stuff that you have to carry around. So you're offended. You're offended, Stan. And then... And then your boss, man, he thought he would throw that at you. And you're like, you know what? I hope he gets fired. Now you've got another offense. Yeah. <laughs> and now the doctor tells you that you've got an illness and that you've got a sickness and you come before the elders. Now, now all of this stuff is invisible in your life, but it's not invisible up here. And it's not invisible here. And you come to the elders and you say, anoint me and pray for me that God would minister to me. And they're praying for you every week. But what they don't realize is you've got this stuff. Wow. You've got this offense. You've got these things that you're carrying around. Because you've been offended. And you were in one church. And you decided to go to another church. Because that other church told you to sit down that you weren't as smart as you thought you were and you told them how gifted you were and your heart's been broken and you've picked up another offense. <laughs> now you tell me how you're supposed to go to, before God in peace because the fact is by the time you get to this point you ain't praying anymore. You're not worshiping anymore. You're watching me on a computer from home because you don't go to church anymore. Yeah. You're broken. You're, you're thinking to yourself, should I, even, should I even be a Christian anymore? Why? And it's not God's love didn't change. And it's not all the churches that you blame. And it's not all the pastors that you blame. It's not the sermons. It's not the song selection. It's that you've picked up this stuff over time. And you're still carrying stuff that does not belong to you. 
You're still carrying things. And the Lord says, cast all your care upon me because I care for you. Now you tell me, after you've been hurt, after you've been offended, after, after a spouse left you, after you lost a child at birth and you just can't seem to forgive God, and, and after you lost your job, and I, after all of these things, now you tell me how you're going to stand there and when the preacher says, let's all lift up holy hands before God. And then, and then the preacher or evangelist really says that God is beckoning somebody. He wants to free you. And you're sitting in that seat knowing that he's preaching to you, but yet you feel compelled to sit there because the weight of everything you're carrying is just too much. I know he's talking to me, but I'm not going to go because all of this is more than I can bear. How's that hand feeling getting... And all you have to do, all you have to do in your heart is truly come before Jesus and say, Lord, I give it to you. And say, Lord, I can't carry this anymore. And he says, you can't, but I can. Lord, I forgive him. It's a scar that I'm tired of carrying. And I forgive him. And the Lord says, it's about time. Lord, this sin that I committed against whoever, I'm giving it to you. And the Lord takes it away. And then by the time the Lord gets done with you, if you will allow him, he will free you of all that stuff. And then guess what? You can be free of all of the things of the world.